So it is now uh, my great pl pleasure to introduce our midday keynote speaker, White House Chief of Staff, Dennis McDonough. Dennis has served as the White House Chief of Staff since February 2013, having previously served as the Deputy National Security Advisor from October 2010 to January 2013. Before that, he was Chief of Staff to the National Security Council, the Deputy National Security Advisor for Strategic Communications, and a key foreign policy aide to then Senator Obama during uh, the campaign. So that's uh, Dennis's uh, resume, minus the stellar college football career and bicycling to work. Uh, but what's uh, not on Dennis's resume, and what makes me especially grateful that Dennis has taken the time to be here today, is that Dennis has been enormously important in integrating TFI into our national security dialogue. In his prior roles in the NSC and in his current capacity, Dennis has always ensured that Treasury not only has a seat at the table, but also that our potential contribution is heard and considered. Across a very broad range of issues, from Iran to North Korea to counterterrorism to intelligence, Dennis has asked how we could assist and has supported, as appropriate, what we've had to offer. In a very real way, Dennis is responsible for what this symposium is all about. So it is my great pleasure to introduce the White House Chief of Staff, Dennis McDonough. David, uh, thank you very much for that very generous and uh, uh, overly generous introduction. John, it's really nice to see you. Neil, great to see you uh, as well. I want to say thanks to everybody at the Office of Terrorism and Financial Intelligence past and present for your contributions uh, to America's security and global leadership. Let me just name three people in particular, all three whom I've just seen. Juan Zarate, uh, who I just saw out in the hallway, uh, Stu, Stuart Levy, and obviously David Cohen. These are three unbelievably capable leaders, uh, and these are three people whom I always want to, well, let me put it this way, three people whom I'm always grateful knowing are on my team. Uh, the work of the Office of Terrorism and Financial Intelligence is vital, as you've been talking all morning, uh, to our country's security and to the world. And it's possible because of the tireless efforts of many of you who are here today, people whom I've been fortunate enough to work with over the last few years, but let me just name some of them. I've seen some of them as well uh, as I've walked in, and I'm sure many others are still back at their desks working away. I want to just name four in particular, Adam Zubin, Leslie Ireland, Danny Glazer, and Jennifer Shosky Calvary. Four unbelievably dedicated and capable people who have been working, uh, and I've seen them working firsthand and uh, implementing the TFI work day in and day out, month after month. This is work that frankly outthinks, outmaneuvers criminals and terrorists in every corner of the world. And I believe, having watched this government work very closely now for nearly six years, that they, those four individuals, plus the three I mentioned a minute ago, are the embodiment of public service, and I'm deeply grateful for their work. The threats we face, obviously, as you've, as you've been discussing and living, are increasingly complex. It's our job to stay at least one step ahead of them. That means using every tool at our disposal, every element of our national power, to protect ourselves and our allies and to stop bad actors of all kinds, whether they're political regimes, terrorist networks, or solitary extremists. We have to be innovative and adaptive, always willing to consider new ideas and revise our approach as needed. And above all, we need to be persistent to keep our heads down and forge ahead for as long as it takes. That's what the President believes, obviously. And we saw an example of his leadership this weekend. After nearly five years in cap captivity, Sergeant Bo Bergdahl is coming home. This was a result of several years of effort by our diplomats and brave men and women in uniform who helped recover the one remaining prisoner of war from Iraq and Afghanistan. Let's also be clear about how we got this done. We've been consulting with members of Congress about this effort, including the potential transfer of five de uh, Gitmo detainees for years. 
I know this because I participated in many of those consultations myself when I served on the staff of the National Security Council. So this should not have been a surprise to any of the members of Congress who have been consulting about it, commenting about it. And I was with the President this weekend when he met with the Bergdahls. All Americans should share in the joy that they feel, and all Americans should know that we did what was necessary to get Bo back. We did not have 30 days to wait to get this done, and when you're Commander-in-Chief, you have to act when there's an opportunity for action. And let me be clear, there's absolutely no qualification on, or caveat to the principle that guided the, Ameri the President in this instance. The United States of America does not leave our men and women in uniform behind, ever. More broadly, our efforts in Afghanistan and beyond remind us that counterterrorism is never easy. Oftentimes, the world and the American people, frankly, don't even learn of our success. That's the nature of this work, of your work, of TFI's work. But persistent, dedicated effort pays off. And few know that better than all the people who at TFI do this work day in and day out. Ten years ago, when this unit was created, the notion of using financial tools to, to stop, stop terrorism terror. and international crimes was still pretty new. And frankly, was seen as an issue of defense. Today, it's a core asset of our national security, and it has us on offense. On behalf of the President, I want to thank you for the enormous range of your work, from the efforts of FinCEN to stop money laundering, to the efforts of the Office of Terrorist Financing and Financial Crimes to stop money from getting to terrorists and criminals. ...sanctions against the regimes that violate international rules. At the Executive Office of Asset Forfeiture, you've directed forfeited funds to law enforcement initiatives. At the Office of Intelligence and Analysis, you help policymakers at the highest levels better understand about how, to, how illicit finance, finance works. works, and therefore, how we can stop it. All this work is sophisticate, sophisticated, creative, and ever more nuanced. They've got both scalpels and sledgehammers in their box of tools, and I can't count the number of times the President and his team have relied on their work and their judgment. When it comes to many of the President's national security priorities, TFI, as David just said, has been an absolutely invaluable asset. A few years ago, the Iranian nuclear program was rapidly advancing. Since then, the United States has built a coalition of nations and businesses willing to impose crippling sanctions on Iran and isolate it from the international financial system. And TFI, obviously, is critical to that work. That included cutting off many of Iran's banks and shr shrinking its oil sales, which helped bring Iran to the negotiating table. When Muammar Gaddafi brutally suppressed a democratic uprising, the President issued an executive order directing this office to prevent him from using Libyan government assets located in the United States to fund that brutality. Within hours, uh, might have even been minutes, David, TFI made sure that more than 30 billion in Libyan assets were beyond Gaddafi's reach. Finally, consider Burma. Only a few years ago, that nation was an intractable, intractable dictatorship, hostile to the United States. But thanks to the extraordinary courage of people in that country, and thanks to Treasury's effort, efforts to design, build, and maintain sanctions against the ruling junta, we have seen political reforms open in a once closed society. We have seen a movement away from partnership with North Korea in favor of engagement with America and our allies, such that our Secretary of Commerce will be traveling there later this week. And today we're supporting this reform through aid and investment, but also through, as I've just said, commercial ties. U.S. companies investing in Burma now are now required to publicly report on their activities as a condition of a Treasury license, because transparency is key to Burma's economic growth and to ensure that it won't end up consolidating power and strangling democratic progress. And by maintaining the specially designated nationals list of individuals and entities in Burma, still subject to sanctions, TFI provides a powerful incentive to those who would resist democracy. Do the right thing and you can get off the list. And if Burma succeeds in its political and economic reform, America will have a critical new partner in a vital region at a vital time. 
Examples like this illustrate just how far the United States has come in terms of the financial tools we use worldwide. Instead of full-fledged full -fledged trade embargoes, we can now apply targeted financial sanctions on selected individuals and entities. Instead of imposing drastic economic costs on an entire people, we can selectively deny a regime the financing and tools it uses to repress its citizens. And we can use and harness to our uh, national security benefit the power of reputational harm that international uh, businesses are eager to avoid by associating themselves with targeted regimes. But the source of our strength abroad has always been our prosperity here at home. And the tools that this office has developed allow us to better protect our own financial system from money laundering, corruption, and other illicit activity. That ju doesn't just protect our families and businesses from economic malfeasance. It defends the very credibility of our financial system, the bedrock of the global financial system. So really, what the men and women of TFI do every day goes far beyond their job descriptions. TFI combines the processing power of financial analyst with the guile and determination of a seasoned investigator and the soft touch, maybe David's softest of all, of a diplomat. They're kind of like IBM, CSI, and James Bond all rolled into one or a financial Batman. As a result, the economic power we exert worldwide has become much more targeted and effective, with fewer costs to our country, less collateral damage to innocent people, and much stronger results for us and for our national interest. Like superheroes generally, they bring light to dark spots where bad guys ply their trade. And as with superheroes generally, I, wouldn't bend, I would not bet against them. TFI has revolutionized our approach, and looking ahead, its importance will continue to grow. The work of detecting, disrupting, and dismantling the financial infrastructure of terrorist organizations is as vital today as it has ever been. And every day there are more players to engage, domestic and international businesses, foreign regulators and ministries, international organizations. When it comes to stopping terrorism, proliferation, transnational crime like trafficking, Financial tools alone won't do the job, but we won't succeed without them. One final thought. We were reminded by the president last week that the world is a very, very messy place. And indeed, there's no end to history. And when this group reconvenes for TFI at 20, we will again marvel at how good work and creative thinking by TFI kept us stead steps ahead of the messy world and the dark corners that hide bad actors. Then, as now, we'll work to strengthen our own economy while bringing economic pressure to bear on bad actors everywhere. Because, as I've said, a strong United States is the foundation for a strong and stable world. So let me close by saying again how grateful the President is for the work of the dedicated men and women of TFI. They've been incredibly valuable to this administration and to this country. I'm proud to call them colleagues. I'm honored to have heard David's comments earlier, and I know that the next 10 years will continue to build on this amazing success. So David, thank you very much. Okay, well, um, after those uh, great remarks from Chief of Staff McDonough, we are going to go to our uh, third panel, uh, which is uh, Neil Wolin, uh, Ruben Jeffrey, and Juan Zarate, who I think they are uh, running back to get mic'd up. So we'll have uh, about a one-minute delay. <laughs> 